Hi Dream Team family, this month's development guide is going to be a little bit different. We have a special guest doing the teaching, but before I introduce our guest, let me talk to you a little bit about what we are covering and why. Over the next two months, we'll be talking about a subject of mental and emotional health. This is a significant and sensitive topic, and we want to unpack it well and add value to you. We are coming out of a two-year pandemic that had a lot of uncertainty and stress, as well as other significant issues. A lot of people are in a traumatized state and don't completely realize it. Many are feeling depleted, fatigued, and are not at their full capacity. Anxiety and depression are at all-time highs. Many Christians find themselves in that state as well. And if you're honest, I'm sure many of you are feeling this way too. The whole purpose of the development guide is to invest and to help each one of you become the best version of yourself. We love you and care about you. So if you find yourself in an emotionally low state right now, or just not at your best mentally, that's okay. But it's not okay to stay there. We want to help. So this month, we have a special guest doing the teaching. It's Dr. Pasquale Chen. Dr. Chen is a clinical psychologist. He's a certified trauma therapist, and he is a certified school psychologist in Pennsylvania. He has many years of experience and comes with a Christian perspective. He and his family have attended Victory for many years, and he is a part of the Dream Team himself. I can speak from personal experience of working with him to say that this teaching will add a lot of value to your life. Dr. Chen has helped me personally when I went through a low time in my life several years ago. I can't encourage you enough to listen to the whole teaching and apply the wisdom to your life. Again, we are talking about the subject of mental and emotional health in September and October. We will have another guest teaching next month. And in the Growing Deeper section in September, I'm actually doing a bonus teaching. So I would encourage you to check that out. There is a lot to cover with this subject and we wanna be thorough and give you the tools packed in godly wisdom and experience so that you can be the best version of yourself. So without further ado, our teaching this month with Dr. Pasquale Chen. Hi, Victory family. My name is Dr. Chen, and I'll be talking about seven keys to improving your emotional and mental health. My hope is that I can share these keys in a way that will help you to see them differently and understand on a deeper level why they are helpful to you. I want to motivate you to implement one or more of these keys consistently in your life to have greater life satisfaction and better mental and emotional health. Sometimes all you need is hearing a truth from a different angle or with a new piece of information that may have been missing before. The first key to improving your mental and emotional health is getting good sleep. We've all heard that before, that sleep is important. Quality sleep improves your mood, heart rate, blood sugar levels, memory, cognitive functioning, immune system, muscle recovery, and helps to maintain a healthy weight. So in reverse, poor sleep can lead to the opposite of those things I just mentioned. Many people think that poor sleep is a result of anxiety, depression, and stress, which is true. At the same time though, the reverse is also true. Research shows that getting poor sleep can lead to anxiety, depression, and stress. Therefore, one of the first things I inquire about within the first two to three sessions with new clients is their quality of sleep. I have had some clients where just addressing their sleep problems resolve many of their depressive and anxious symptoms. Now, here are some guidelines to getting good sleep if you are having problems going to sleep or staying asleep. This is not medical advice, and check with your doctor if you have uh, significant uh, insomnia. First, Wake up at the same time every day and go to bed no earlier than the time you intended, preferably at least 14 hours from the time you got out of bed. Go to bed when you are sleepy, not when you're tired. The difference is that feeling sleepy is when you feel like you're about to fall asleep and can barely keep your eyes open. An example of feeling tired is if you just got home from a long day of work and you just want to sit and watch TV, but you're not necessarily sleepy. It's best not to go to bed before your intended bedtime because you may end up just lying in bed awake trying to fall asleep, which is not good. So if you plan on waking up every day at 7 a.m. and go to bed by 9 p.m., do not go to bed before 9 p.m. Again, these guidelines are for people having a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep. If you're in bed and you can't fall asleep, stop trying. The more you try to fall asleep, the more likely you will not fall asleep. 
If you can't fall asleep within 20 minutes or so, get up and do something calming and boring and return to bed only when you're sleepy again. When you lie in bed awake trying to fall asleep, wanting and hoping to go back to sleep, you're training yourself to be awake in bed. Use the bed only for sleeping and if you're married, sex, nothing else. You also want to avoid daytime napping, which can interfere with falling asleep at night. Avoid alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine, which all interfere with sleep. Exercise regularly, but not too close to bedtime. Schedule relaxing, quiet time an hour before bed. If you're a clock watcher at night, hide the clock or turn it away from the bed. That is a big one. You do not want to look at the clock if you're having trouble falling asleep because it will just cause more anxiety that you're not asleep yet. What tends to happen is that you'll start doing math in your head about whether you'll be able to fall asleep by X time and be able to get X hours of sleep, and you'll be wondering if that will be enough. So don't do that. Finally, eating a good amount of protein during the day and taking magnesium at night can also help with restful and restorative sleep. Now, if you're not having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, but you're waking up feeling tired and not refreshed, you might just need to go to bed at a decent hour, probably no later than 10.30 or 11 p.m., uh, for most people, okay? The next key is mindful deep breathing practices. Now, when I say mindful, all I mean is being aware of your breath. When you're mindful of something, you are paying attention to it. For many people, when they start to pay attention to their breathing, their breath slows down, which activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of the body that helps you to relax. So again, when I say mindful deep breathing, I'm just saying paying attention to your breath, focusing on it, and spending a few minutes doing that. If you struggle with anxiety, depression, or chronic stress, and you're not mindful of your breath while doing this exercise, then you're probably thinking about a worrisome and stressful thought. Focusing on the breath keeps your attention on the present moment. So I'll often have clients spend five to seven minutes in my office practicing this skill, and when it does not work, it is usually because their mind drifted away from their breath. Their mind went to an anxious future or a negative past, and they never brought their attention back to their breath. When you take a deep breath, you want to take a nice abdominal breath, not a big chest breath. Your abdomen should inflate and deflate as you breathe. For those of you with animals or little kids, you'll see that they naturally take belly breaths. Their stomach expands as they inhale and contracts when they exhale. As we get older, many of us stop breathing as we naturally should and start breathing more with our chest, which is incorrect breathing. When you do this practice for five to 10 minutes a day, your breath serving as an anchor to keep your mind drifting away from the present moment. You're strengthening the part of your brain that is involved with self-directed attention. You decide where attention goes as opposed to your emotions deciding for you. Doing this helps you to relax your body and can help decrease depression, anxiety, and stress, according to research. Practicing mindful breathing can also help with self-regulation. For example, when I'm in the middle of something and all my four kids are talking to me at the same time and asking me questions, I can get easily flustered. Sometimes I want to yell at them for that. However, instead of doing that, I can take that mindful breath, create space between my stressful situation and my reaction, and give myself a moment to respond in a loving way instead of reacting. The third key to improving your mental and emotional health is engaging in life-giving activities. These activities that cost energy but give back so much more. It is different for each person. For me, watching a movie is relaxing and fun, but it's not life-giving, although for someone else it could be. Going to jiu-jitsu practice is life-giving for me. When I go, I am exercising in a physically taxing way. When I am done, I feel great. I have more energy to play with my kids and help out around the house. For people who are high on extroversion, spending time with friends is usually life-giving. For introverts, reading a book, studying something, or doing something alone, or with a small group of people might be life-giving. So find out what is life-giving to you and make an effort to do it at least once a week. If you're not sure what you find life-giving, you can have a joy journal. Basically, for a period of a week to a month, write down all the things that bring joy to you and rate them from one to 10. One being no joy, 10 being full of joy in life. Then focus on doing the things that are seven or higher. Now, the fourth key is processing your emotions well. When you're able to effectively process your emotions, you'll feel better. For those who have high emotional intelligence, this may be second nature to you. There are many books written on this topic and much research done on emotional regulation and how to effectively process your emotions. One way to do it, according to Dr. Mark Brackett, who wrote the book, Permission to Feel, is to use the RULER method. RULER is an acronym which stands for five areas of emotional intelligence. Recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating emotions. 
So for example, the scenario of me in the middle of a task and all four of my kids are saying, daddy, 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 and they all want something from me. At the same time, the first step to using ruler would be to recognize I'm feeling something, not suppress it, avoid it, or ignore it. I would also focus on recognizing that my kids are feeling something too. Maybe they're excited, hangry, happy, upset, something. Then I would seek to understand why I am feeling what I am feeling and try to understand what they are feeling as well. Then I would label what I'm feeling using an emotion word, such as overwhelmed, annoyed, irritated, or flustered. After that, I would identify an appropriate way to express how I'm feeling. So instead of yelling, be quiet, everyone, I might take my mindful breath and say firmly but kindly, I want to hear all of you, but you must talk one at a time. You go first. Finally, I would regulate how I was feeling if I was still feeling overwhelmed after I addressed the situation. To do this, I might spend a moment just thinking about how grateful I am for my kids or just telling some jokes with them. So the next key is exercise. Again, we all know this is important and we have heard this before, that exercise is good at reducing stress and feeling better. But did you know that some research studies show that exercise can be just as effective as medication or therapy for some people with depression? Again, I wanna say that again. Exercise can be just as effective as medication or therapy for treating depression for some people. Some studies show it can also help with anxiety and ADHD symptoms. In addition to improving mental and emotional health, exercise helps with reducing the risk of chronic diseases, reducing pain, improving skin, living longer, maintaining a healthy weight, improving sleep, and increasing energy. Exercise literally changes your brain's function, physiology, and anatomy for the long term, helping create new brain cells, which can help with cognitive functioning and memory. With almost every client, I always include exercise as part of the treatment plan. Here are three tips for sticking with an exercise routine. First, pick something you enjoy. Enjoying the activity is crucial to long-term engagement. If you hate running, I wouldn't recommend running as part of your exercise. Personally, I hate running, but I really enjoy doing jiu-jitsu, which is what I do for my exercise. Two, find an activity buddy, which adds social engagement and enhances commitment and reward for most people. My wife goes to Burn Boot Camp in Wexford, and they have an amazing community there. The main reason why she has been able to go there consistently for years is that she goes with friends. When she doesn't feel like going in the morning, what gets her up is knowing that her friends will be there too. The third one can be motivating for some and discouraging for others, so know yourself, but it is charting your progress. Now the sixth key is eating well. Why do so many of us consistently eat what is not good for us, myself included? Notice that I said consistently. I am all about treats, snacks, ice cream, fried food, etc. I think we should be able to enjoy life. But we need to consume unhealthy foods in moderation. When I overindulge, which is more times than I like to admit, I often feel guilty, bloated, tired, and lethargic, and my focus is completely off. Conversely, when I eat whole foods and healthy meals, I feel good, energized, and I'm in a better mood. And here's why. The brain is a physical thing and needs physical things like healthy foods to function at its best. I cannot stress enough the importance of getting protein in your body. Ideally, every meal should contain protein. Protein is constructed of amino acids. When you eat protein and your body digests the protein into amino acids, you're nourishing your body and brain. Amino acids help with the production of neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and endorphins, which all play a role in your mood and mental emotional health. Basically, without adequate protein, deficiencies in neurotransmitters will occur, which can have a significant negative effect on your mood, sleep, and stress level. Without these neurotransmitters functioning properly, you will feel bad. This is just one reason why it's important to eat well and have adequate protein in your body. I heard this one doctor say, telling people to change their diet is like telling them to change their religion. So our relationship with food is much deeper than just physical nourishment and can be quite complicated. Education is only part of helping people to eat better. My hope is that you'll become more aware of your food choices, not that you need to try to eat perfectly. Start making small changes given where you're at in life. You can simply start with eating an adequate amount of protein, preferably every meal, use healthy fats like coconut and olive oil for cooking, and eat more vegetables and fruit. Also eat complex carbs like beans, oatmeal, quinoa, barley, and sweet potatoes. Don't start by focusing on what not to eat. Focus on what to eat, and then you'll naturally be eating less of what you probably shouldn't be eating as much. 
I was working with this one client who wanted to focus on his weight and eat less. He shared with me that every day he emotionally ate and would sometimes be in front of his refrigerator for long periods of time trying to decide what to eat that was healthy. He didn't know what to eat, so he just opted for junk food. I focused with him on just winning the first meal of the day, getting out of the all or nothing thinking that he was doing. He liked eggs and was fine with bananas, so we decided that his default breakfast would be eggs, bananas, and a piece of toast. Anytime he started to wonder what he should eat for breakfast, he would just remind himself that he could eat eggs, banana, and toast for breakfast. As a result, he avoided feeling indecisive and frustrated and didn't have junk food for breakfast. If he wanted to eat something different for breakfast, he could, as long as it was a healthy and intentional choice. Gradually, we worked on winning two meals a day, breakfast and lunch. From doing that, combined with walking and addressing some of his emotional issues, he started to lose weight and feel better. The last key I want to talk about is thinking and speaking godly thoughts out loud to yourself. I cannot stress this enough. This one has the power to enable you to do all the other ones. For example, eating healthy and exercising are both important keys that I just mentioned. But if you're not doing them, it is probably because there's something wrong, negative, irrational, or defeatist thinking going on. But if you are thinking like God, and speaking like how God speaks, you will be enabled by the power of your words and beliefs to begin to make progress in every area. The primary therapeutic approach I use in my office is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT for short. It is research-based and, in my opinion, aligns with godly principles. CBT basically says that our thoughts lead to how we feel and, have, and then leads to how we behave. And this also goes in reverse. What we can do is influence how we feel and how we think. For example, if you and I are on an airplane together and there's turbulence, that is an event we both are experiencing. If I think turbulence means something's wrong with the engine and the plane's going to crash, I'm going to start to feel scared and panicky and I'll probably yell and scream. Now, if you were sitting right next to me and you thought turbulence is part of flying, not a big deal, it's all good, you'll feel fine and relaxed and you'll continue to read your book, listen to your music, or watch your movie. You see how that works? It was not the turbulence that bothered me, it was my take on it, my cognitive appraisal of the event, or what I thought about it. Now, let's say I was depressed and I start to isolate myself, eat too much ice cream, and watch too much Netflix. Those are my behaviors. If that is what I'm doing, my depression will worsen and I'll start thinking more negatively. I might think, man, no one likes me, no one wants to call me to hang out, I'm just such a loser. But the reality is people stopped calling me to hang out because I kept isolating myself. So if I force myself to exercise, hang out with my friends, do a life-giving activity, I'll start to feel better and start thinking more clearly. So the Word tells us that we are to renew our minds, that we are to do that, not God. The Word also says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So there's this pamphlet from Victory that has godly confessions, and I'll often have clients read this out loud by faith while I agree with them in faith about what they are confessing, and they often feel better after doing it. And I have them do it for homework. You see, when you do this, it is renewing your mind to the truth about who you are and about your situation. It also strengthens your faith because you're hearing the word out loud when you read it. When you start believing differently about yourself and your situation, that you're more than a conqueror, above and not beneath, the head and not the tail, you'll start feeling differently. You'll start acting differently. You'll start feeling better. This is the good fight of faith, believing what is truly true and fighting off doubt. This helps you to be so full of faith and truth that there's no room for doubt. The devil is constantly trying to get you to doubt God's word. That's what he did to Eve, causing her to doubt what God said to her about eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The devil tries to get me to doubt myself, doubt God's promises, and doubt my gifts and graces. But I have to make a decision every day to think like God and to act like God and to confess God's word about me every single day, to stay in faith and live a life that is stress-free. Now, I just want to mention this. I heard one time Pastor John say that just because he's a pastor does not mean he has a special dispensation of grace to walk out God's word. And same here. He has to do it like everyone else, and I have to do it like everyone else. Even though I teach this, I know this, I'm here, I have to, same thing, walk that fight of faith each day. And so I just wanted to share that with you. Now, I work with many who have had traumatic experiences, who experienced trauma in their childhood, and who grew up with parents that were abusive and neglectful. We can't change the past, but we can change the way how we see the past, which then will change the present and the future. 
Many people who have been abused as children feel and believe as adults that they're inadequate and unworthy of love and affection. By helping them to renew their minds, change the way they think and believe about themselves, and see the past in light of God's truths, and not as through the lens of how they were abused, then they'll start feeling better, living better, and experiencing freedom. Now, here are three ways to get started on speaking godly thoughts to yourself out loud. First, make godly confessions regularly, like this pamphlet that I referenced earlier. Read it every day in faith out loud. Second, listen to sermons regularly, every day if possible. Those who drive to work can easily do that by listening to a sermon in the car. You can listen while you're folding the laundry, going for a walk, right before bed, or while you're waiting in your car for your kids to be done with the sport. I had this one Christian client who was struggling with fear and anxiety. He had been a Christian for several years, but was just struggling with feeling panicky, edgy, and anxious. It was affecting his marriage and parenting. At the end of my first session with him, I gave him the homework of listening to Free From All Fears by Brother Keith Moore, which is a series. His commutes were very long, so he was able to finish the series more than once. At my second session with him, his mood was significantly better. He seemed happier, lighter, and was no longer anxious. Now, I probably saw him only one other time besides that, and, and it was amazing. Now, this is not the norm, but the exception in terms of what I see in my office, but it was still quite amazing. The third way to start speaking godly words over yourself is to talk to yourself as God would talk to you. You will know how God talks to you because you have been making godly confessions and listening to sermons and from reading the Bible. God is love, and he is a truth teller and an encourager and a comforter and much, much more. So what you say to yourself should be encouraging, comforting, loving, and truthful. That's how you will know that it is how God would talk to you. Now, I hope this message has helped you to summarize, get good sleep, eat well, exercise, take some deep breaths, process your emotions, engage in life-giving activities, and finally think and speak like God. Thank you.